five. Good morning, everyone. My name is Josh Toso. Thank you for joining and tuning in and welcome back to the Starboard Portal. As we look forward to brighter and sunnier days and getting back out in the water, today we have expert guidance for you on skin cancer prevention from Edith Olaz Harkin, MD, PhD. Thanks Edith for joining us today and thank you to all our viewers for tuning in and for all of those who are gonna watch this presentation on playback some point later. If you wanna learn some more and uh, some more of the great things that Harkin Durham is doing, uh, after this, head over to harkenderm.com to learn some more. And if you enjoyed today's session or any of the other sessions that we've put on or continue to put on, please support our efforts to build a community of active and engaged sailors through the Starboard Portal by purchasing or renewing U.S. Sailing membership. We have tons of great content coming up on the schedule. And thanks to U.S. Sailing members, we're able to adapt and evolve to better serve sailors with content like this. So please, please visit us at mem.ussailing.org and join or renew your U.S. Sailing membership today. Now on to the show for today. Sailors are considered high risk for skin cancer, as we all know that, due to the cumulative lifetime solar ultraviolet radiation, which is the principal cause for factors of melanoma and keratinocyte cancer. Sun protection, including the use of protective clothing and sunscreen is paramount, and the only strategy that can lower the rate at which new cancers arise. Dr. Olaz Harkin will provide professional guidance about skin cancer prevention and update you on potential adverse effects of sunscreens on human health and marine environment. It is Edith Olaz Harkin, MD, PhD, is an associate professor of dermatology at the Medical College of Wisconsin. She her, uh, received her medical degree and PhD from University of Szeged, Hungary. She completed her dermatology residency at the Medical College of Wisconsin, where she served as chief resident. Dr. Olaz Harkin, has extensive basic science training in skin immunology, uh, including postdoctoral fellowship at dermatology branch of National Institutes of Health. She's an expert in treating high-risk skin cancers in immune suppressed patients and a member of the Freydiv Multidisciplinary Skin Transplant Skin Cancer Group. She's director of aesthetic and laser surgery clinics and resident aesthetic education. She has numerous scientific publications and book chapters and has been invited speaker to many national and international dermatology meetings. She served as a formal uh, mentor for both American Academy of Dermatology and the American Society of Dermatologic Surg Surgery Leadership Program. She's a member of national and international boards and committees on transplant dermatology, skin cancer, prevention, and cutting edge research in cosmetic surgery. She is a past president of the Wisconsin Dermatology Society and currently serves at the American Academy of Dermatology Advisory Board as Wisconsin representative. Edith also grew up sailing on Lake Balaton in Hungary in the summers, and she founded Harkin Derm in 2017 with her husband, Peter Harkin. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you all to our friend from Harkin Derm, Edith Olas Harkin. Thanks, Edith, for joining us. Thanks. Thank you so much. I think we have a background. Is that better now? Well, thank you so much and thanks for the introduction. Gosh, I didn't know you're gonna do the whole thing, you know? Uh, <clears throat> so I'm so happy to do this. I love the education and uh, I think Starboard Portal is a great new platform. Um, I wish you best of luck. And there's sometimes good things come out of those, uh, these bad times and one of is this, all these educational pieces. So uh, I think you see my slide already and I wanna start like, hello, cool kittens and cats. <laughs> well, we are always, we're going crazy in this time, but I will talk about sunscreens today. And uh, these are times when science does matter. So because my background is, um, is of course in, in dermatology, I wanna make sure that you know, I'm talking about science. I will really not, talk about any kind of fake news or assumption and, and such. So I have some conflict of interest uh, or so-called disclosure, but um, they are not ne <clears throat> neither conflicts, more of all interest of mine. Of course, Harkin Durham, as you heard about it, and we are very proud to be the uh, official sunscreen for the US sailing team. And there is Riley and congratulations, Riley and Anna for your making the Olympic team. We are so proud of you. And uh, as Josh mentioned, I'm married to Peter. So, so the whole sailing and sunscreen business um, came from there. And I will talk to you about a little bit later. So 
I have, as Josh told you, uh, background in skin cancer treatment. That's one of my specialty. I spent actually time uh, during training uh, in Germany studying specially photobiology, so the interaction of the of light with skin. And uh, and uh, lately, in the last uh, ten years, I've been also doing a lot of skin aging and cosmetic dermatology. So I've been published extensively, and then one of these publications is actually about sunscreens. So on the left, there is one of my patients, and uh, I will reveal you who he is. Uh, and then the right side of the screen is another patient. I got to tell you, the left side, the patient is a sailor, and the right side is a patient who is a, is a transplant patient, an organ transplant patient. So I consider them both very high risk because sailors are immunosuppressed actually as cumulative sun exposure does cause immunosuppression in the skin. And of course, organ transplant patients are immunosuppressed because of the drugs we give them in order to accept the, the organ. So basically it, you have to remember that UV light is immunosuppressive. So I talk, I look at my sailors, my sailor patients, somewhat like my high-risk skin cancer patient. So this is actually Dick Stern and he told me I can use his slides and uh, hopefully you all know as sailors who Dick Stern is, but Dick Stern <clears throat> was a, a star a silver medalist in Tokyo Olympics. Before that, he won the Pan American Games. So he's a very accomplished sailor and also co-founded the uh, Lens End. And um, Dick has been my patient uh, after I realized at a party how severely sun damaged he was, and you may not see it, but here's my cursor. He developed a very bad uh, metastatic skin cancer, but we fixed it. He's still alive, 93 year old, having fun. So um, I'm very happy about that. I always, when I t give these talks, I always say sailors are exposed to a triple pleasure which is the sun, the water, and the wind, but it's also a triple uh, threat. Why is that? You know, these are all elements that severely damage the skin. So I don't wanna give you a lecture about why you need to use sunscreen. You kind of know, we know from Australia, the sleep, sweat, swap campaign, and we know that, that using sun protection really does reduce your skin cancer risk. We also know that from my transplant population that are really high risk, so it's easy to do studies because they get very frequent skin cancer. If we put them on a strong, strong sun protection, we can really reduce the, um, the number of the new skin cancers. So here comes the question, which sunscreen? Okay, and, and it is tough. And people ask me, why are you crazy? Why are you coming up with a sunscreen? There are over 2,000, skews of sunscreen in the United States only, and there is much more. And I used to say, well, the best sunscreen is what you use. That's what we dermatologists used to say. We don't say that anymore. And I don't really say that at all for high-risk transplant patients and high-risk uh, patients like sailors. You really need to know what sunscreen you use. So by having so many, that is also kind of gave me a possibility to realize that people don't know how to make a good choice. And with traveling with Peter and going around um, and looking at what I found on the boat and half of them were expired, half of them was really bad sunscreen. That's where I kind of came up with the idea of, of how we, we, I really need to kind of educate and help sailors to teach them what are really good sunscreens. So, but, you know, as Simon Sinek said, always start with a why. I mean, you won't know what sunscreen to use if you don't know why you are using this sunscreen. So the first part of my talk, I'd like to talk about the science, what happens when with solar radiation to the skin. And I just decided to do that because I realized that a lot of people are really don't understand a lot of things what happening up on sun exposure. So, Let's see, the sunlight spectrum, as you know, actually 50% of the sunlight is, is visible light, okay? Visible light is a pretty benevolent light. There is actually some good, good of, um, biological effects. The other uh, ends are UV light, which is about 5%, and the infrared light, those are the kind of a longer wavelengths. 
the shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy, the longer the wavelength, the deeper those uh, lights can penetrate into your skin. So we basically separate these lights with these wavelengths by their uh, nanometer, uh, how, how long these wavelengths are, okay? So they have direct effects and we will go through all these, but which directly affect the DNA and oxidative da damage, then sunburn and what these lights do, all right? So I used to never even mention UVC light. Why am I talking about today about UVC light? So UVC light is the third member of the UV light. Um, the UVC light is basically between 100 and, and 280 nanometer. And the UVC light is actually absorbed by the ozone layer. So we, our skin, our environment doesn't see naturally UVC light. However, uh, we use that light for its germicidal purposes. So it does kill bacteria and virus, and we do use this light to basically clean surfaces. So I don't want to name name, but a lately White House um, press conference, somebody mentioned to use this type of UV light or actually not even specifically UVC, but just UV light to kill COVID. But I gonna tell you, and I don't wanna be going into politics, this is a very dangerous slide. And on the right side, I show you, um, we say, we, this is a sign which we put on our phototherapy units or UV, using UVA and UVB light to treat some diseases, but it's still very dangerous. So UVC light is extremely dangerous for the, for the eyes. So it causes cataract and it also can be carcinogenic. There are some new research now showing that some wavelengths may be not as bad for humans, but I would please, please don't use any kind of UV light to try to kill the virus. On top of it also, please don't use sun, don't stop using sunscreen because you will think that the sunlight will kill the virus on your face. So there are some new players in the sunscreen game and uh, some, there are some truth into it, Sometimes it's a little bit of a marketing gimmick, but you, if you are really big into sunscreen, you may heard about blue light and infrared light also harming the skin. So blue light especially is pushed right now because blue light is coming out of screens, you know, computer screens and your phone screens. So blue light is the first visible wavelength which comes after UVA light. So there is not such thing as black and white in nature. The 400, which divides UVA light, which is a harmful light, and we talk about it, and blue light, is basically an arbitrary cutoff. So there is some truth into it because uh, your skin will not just say, oh, it's below 400, it's 399 nanometers, so I'm, I'm dangered now. And then it's a 300, or it's 401 nanometers, so it's a blue light, it's not dangerous anymore. So I do believe that there is some truth that very cumulative and extensive exposure to a blue light wavelength may also have some harmful effects. The infrared light comes on the 760 to 14 nanometer range. And those are some of the, especially the closer infrared has some harmful effects, mainly because this is the main rays from the sun which gives you the heat, okay? And we know that there's a lot of conditions in the skin that can be worsened by heat. One is rosacea, that's kind of red, flushy skin. The other is melasma, which is kind of the liver spots, those deep brown pigmentation. So, and of course it can make other inflammatory diseases even worse. And that's the reason we are thinking about not trying to uh, protect from those new type of kind of newer wavelengths that we may think are dangerous. By going back, the most important two wavelengths are UVB and UVA, you know, and it's always easy to remember B is for burning and A is for aging. The B is because it's a shorter wavelength, it doesn't really go very deep, it mainly stops uh, at the epidermis, which is the very top layer of the skin. The UVA the one goes much deeper and goes into the dermis that where our collagen is, and we'll talk about how that harms the skin. So burning, why do we burn? 
what happens when we burn? Basically, we scorch our DNA. Okay, so this is a direct mutagenic effect. And if you think about what happens is that I will tell you about how what melanocytes, the pigment producing cells do, but they try to, to produce pigments. There's not enough time at the beginning for producing pigment. So no matter what, the, um, there is a direct damage. Now the cells can decide what to do, okay? Or the, the, the body decides what to do. If the damage is too much, so here, if you look at your curs my cursor, it's working, the cells are sent to die. And those are the sunburn cells. And those are the cells actually then come up with your peel, okay? They're dead cells that they were so damaged that you had to get rid of. Otherwise, there would have been cancer all over because obviously the mutation causes skin cancer. The skin has a natural anti, uh, a natural repair mechanism actually called DNA repair me mechanism. So if the damage is not that bad and there is a good repair, then they go back and they live happily after. And there is unfortunately kind of an in-between as always, there is an in-between in biology and <clears throat> there are some cells that the damage is not that bad, so they totally, they don't die, so they survive, but there's still some mutation. And that's what happens with cumulative sun exposure, okay? So basically those cells, more and more and more, these UV induced mutation is accumulated in the cell. And at the end, just like filling a glass, drop by drop by water, there comes a point when the, the, the glass is overfilled. And at that point, every single UV damage and UV induced mutation then will turn the, the cells cancerous, okay? So that's the reason cumulative sun exposure, although it will not induce skin cancer right away, will, it, will in time um, result in skin cancer because that all adds on. So. Here you go, you, I hear this all the time. I turn quickly, do I need to use a sunscreen? I will never get skin cancer. And of course, there are a lot of sailors who are darker skin, they, they, they're fine. They, they think like they will never get a skin cancer. So, um, you know, the risk for, of, for skin cancer is basically very much determined of, of your skin type. So that's true, if you have a type of skin that is very, very tan, your, your risk is much less. So if we dermatologists call them these Fitzpatrick skin types, and basically this is a self-determined skin type. You yourself can tell what kind of Fitzpatrick skin type you have, because you need to answer this question. I, the number one, the, the type one is, oh, I always burn, never tan. And basically those are the red hair, heads, red hair people white skin and it goes on and on like usually burn but have a difficulty tanning and so on so i always ask my residents when i teach that guess what whose skin is actually gets the most cumulative sun damage <clears throat> whose skin gets the most aging and as actually that's that the type three skin those people who are white but they tan really easily so they love to tan so they collect all that damage all the time the people who have type one skin, usually if they really stay out of the sun because they get a couple of really bad sunburns when they're young, they actually tend to do fairly well. They don't really develop any wrinkles, not much skin cancer, unless they're sailors and they have to be out on the sun all the time. So, and then that becomes a problem. But basically, if you think about, uh, if you're a white uh, redhead, your, your SPF is zero. A, a, a kind of the type two gives you a two or four and as and black people as their skin color equals to about an SPF 60. So, and actually that corresponds of their risk. So they are like 60 times less um, 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 risky to get skin cancer. So I'd like to tell you a little bit what gives you the color and that's called melanin, okay? These are the pigment particles in your skin. And it's very, very important for you to understand there's two types of melanin. There's so-called eumelanin and pheomelanin. The eumelanins are black and brown people and the pheomelanin is red and, and, uh, and uh, blonde people. Now we all both have this type of melanin, but <clears throat> the type one people almost exclusively have the pheomelanin 
and very little eumelanin. And then when you progress, darker people have much more eumelanin, both in ratio and quantity, okay? So this is what actually gives you the color. So what makes the melanin so magical? Melanin is like basically an umbrella for your skin cells or keratinocytes. Those top layer of the skin have the keratinocytes. And the melanin sits in the top and protects the nucleus where the DNA is from the sun. Melanin is, is the skin's natural sunscreen, okay? Unfortunately, the feel melanin, the, the, the red pigment doesn't protect very much, okay? It's almost like a transparent umbrella. And uh, the darker umbrella is the human and that protects you very much. Now, if you think about this little cabana boy here, which delivers the umbrellas, this is the melanocyte, okay? This is the cell that produces the pigment. The, this delivers the, the kind of the umbrellas. Now you have, you are born with the, the number and the type of umbrellas you have. When you tan, when you go on the sun, there are two things, Two things happen. Things happen. One, immediately you get you, your your these melanin particles can change. You know, there's an oxidative, there's a process, and they they turn darker. But only you melanin can do that, and that is called immediate pigment darkening. So you even after one short tanning, you see this grayish brown color. But what is real tan is that these these melanocytes that look like polyps, okay, with all these kind of dendrites, they're, they're deliver these, these melanin particles, they start to produce it and deliver it up to the skin. Now I have to tell you, and I think it, it's fascinating that we are also born with the kind of the, the um, number of our melanocytes, okay? So one melanocyte is delivering pigment, delivering these um, protective umbrellas to about 40 keratinocytes, okay? So we, if we have more melanocytes in an area that's a mole, okay, that gives us that brown moles. And, and, and of course, dark people have dark moles and the redheads have more pink moles. So, and when that melanocyte gets too much damage and mutates and becomes cancerous, that's what gives us melanoma, okay? But basically what is very important to understand that there's not such thing as a safe tan, okay? So people think, oh, I tan easily, I will never get a skin cancer. Uh, there, the tan means your melanocyte was injured by UV light, the melanocyte the, that little umbrella boy uh, was told by and that, hey, I need to protect the cell. I have an injury. I need to protect the cells. So I need to produce more melanin. And that's why uh, when you're not 10, that's, let's see, that's an SPF zero. When you 10, you give yourself about an SPF two to four, but the 10 is never safe. Okay, so that's one, something I'd like you to understand. So in order to really know your skin cancer risk, as I told you, your skin type is very important. And I don't need to give a big lecture for, for African-American skin because their skin cancer risk is much lower. So what you are listening here is for, for, for skin cancer risk-wise, it's for, of course, light skin people. But it also matters, and I always ask my pa patients, how many early life burns, sunburns, or peely burns did you get? Because sunburn in an earlier life is much more dangerous, okay? Of course, cumulative sun exposure, and that's what you get as a sailor being out there all the time. Artificial tanning use is almost doubles your risk for melanoma if you do it before age of 30. Family history, of course, your genetics, so how many moles or whether your parents have had skin cancer. And then if you're a very moly person, probably your risk is somewhat higher for melanoma. So it's really important to screen and protect, okay, your skin because it is, if nothing yours, then your children, because you will remember that. And I always say it's never too late to stop uh, the damage. So you remember when you, when you stop smoking, your lung can kind of recover. You stop drinking, your, your liver can recover. And it is absolutely the same for skin cancer and sun damage. So it is, 
I hear it all the time. Oh, do doctor, I have doctor. I say, I had so much sun damage already. It doesn't matter. It does matter because you can make a difference. Any time of your age, you can make a difference for skin cancer risk. For aging and wrinkles, that's a little bit more tough. That's where I, my lasers come in and my procedures because giving back uh, a smooth, buncy skin full with collagen and elastin is not that easy. So, but as, uh, as in this TED talk, uh, the surprising solution to ocean plastic was told that probably instead of keep mopping the floor when the sink is overfilling, it's much better to close your faucet, okay? Or shut off your faucet. So it's the same thing, not just cutting skin cancer and trying to, you know, do all kinds of skin cancer treatments, but stopping sun damage will make a big difference. So let's talk about UVA light because we talked about the burning kind of mutagenic rays. So UVA light primary causes oxidative damage. And, and primary is responsible for skin aging. On the left side, this is a very famous picture. Probably maybe you've seen that, that she was a truck driver. And um, this demonstrates also very important, uh, important point that UVA light actually is coming through the glass. Okay, there are not in the front window actually on the, uh, the, on the door, uh, the car that has a screen that filters out UVA but the side uh, windows and normal windows that they're not tinted bled through about 70, 75% of UVA light. So UVB light, of course, it's filtered. So it is very important to know that in, if you are, have an office, even now during uh, COVID times and when we are staying at home, if you have an office and you're in front of your window, and you, you get, feel this heat on your skin, it means that you get, get that UV light. So, so what's oxidative stress? If you put up and cut up the apple in half, what happens when it gets kind of brown and shrivels up, that is actually oxidative stress, okay? The same thing happens with the cells. So from a beautiful apple, you end up with a very wrinkled skin, okay? So importantly, because UVA light goes very deep, and although melanin does is an antioxidant, so it helps a little bit with UVA damage as well, but not as well, not as much than UVB damage. So this is a famous picture I, I, I took. Um, I took a photograph from a, a National Geographic picture. He's from Mongolia, but he has a darker skin type. But all the wind, the cold, the sun does age your skin no matter of how dark you are. So the, the, uh, the major factor, the biggest contributor of oxidative stress is sun. But pollution, smoke, stress, they all can cause this so-called oxidative um, um, damage. And what, what is that? You create these free radicals and they're like bouncing around with an unstable missing electron and scavenge around and wanna steal an electron from other molecules and that's what hurts everything around them okay so it breaks it causes cellular damage and actually indirectly dna damage so it also causes skin cancer it breaks down the collagen also weakens the kind of this lipid layer we talked about talk about it it weakens your upper layer of the epidermis because it it um oxidizes those lipids that serves as glue glue and it also damages the melanocytes, those little umbrella boys. So they start to spit out more pigment and gives you those sunspots. So this is just the concept. And that's what you as a sailor also need to understand that UV light through oxidative stress, but then you get the wind and other factors damages this very upper layer of the skin. And this very upper layer called coronified layer. So this very upper layer basically consists of dead skin cells glued together with this, by this lipid bilayer, bilayer. And that creates a seal. That seal is so strong that no water can go inside of your skin. So you can swim for hours, swim across the Atlantic channel and there, you're not gonna blow up with water, okay? However, if this seal is damaged, there is so-called barrier damage, again, by the oxidative stress by UVA light, 
or sun or, or, or wind or cold and other um, environmental factors, it becomes leaky. And that's when moisture can evaporate, so your skin becomes really dry and cracked correctly, and also basically all harmful substances, um, bacteria and allergens can go in and you can get inflammation. So as a sailor, you don't even, don't even only think about sun protection. You have to think about how you keep that barrier intact because that barrier gets damaged every time you're out there. So because of this oxidative damage, it's very important to think about using antioxidants with your sunscreen or within your sunscreen. That's very much a part of, of, of what you get from the sun. And that's why I was explaining you to you what happens when, when the sun hits the skin. So when you use an antioxidant, then you will protect your skin also from UV. So it's kind of a UV booster, these antioxidants. You protect your lipid layer, so you protect your barrier. You reduce the pigment and the redness, the inflammation, and also help those melanocytes not to give you the freckles and the sunspot. And it actually can increase collagen produ production kind of indirectly by making sure that those enzymes that break down the collagen are not upregulated. So we talked about the UVA and the UVB. <clears throat> And that's what we need to protect. So now let's talk about really, really, what are my sunscreen recommendations? So, um, and then we're gonna take questions at the end. That's what we decided with Josh. So um, if you don't mind. So the American Academy of Dermatology recommends these things. And oh, would, if that would be this easy, it would be so nice. So we say, you need to use something SPF 30 or higher, which is also broad spectrum and water resistant, and put at least one ounce of sunscreen, which fills a shot glass to cover exposed areas on the body. Done, my talk is done, okay? So that could be something which it would be easy, but unfortunately, this is not that easy. And every time I traveled and see so sailors, um, again, people don't know what they're using. So let's talk about the first recommendation, SPF 30 or higher. What is an SPF, the sun protection factor? So this is a concept you need to understand that SPF is measured by measuring people response to UV, B light, UV light, but it, by measuring their redness, how quickly they get red. Now, redness is caused by UVB, okay? So you only measuring the UVB protection if you're measuring SPF, okay? So this is one really important point. So SPF equals UV protection. The other point is always a little bit complicated to explain because if you have no sunscreen, you can stay out um, for 20 minutes. If you have a sunscreen which give you an SPF 2, you can double your time. SPF for quadruple your time, but but when, but it, it doesn't go like, but it's very difficult to understand because when you look at these SPFs, you this curve kind of flattens down. Okay, so SPF two is fifty percent, but SPF four doesn't give you a hundred percent protection. So. Uh, it is so much easier, and, and that's how I teach my residents to, to, to understand if you reverse it. You don't think about how much light is filtered out by your UV filter, but how much light comes through to your skin. It's, this is just Popeye who doesn't know what's, what the heck I'm talking about, but because people are having a hard time to, to understand this concept. So this is the way I explain it. If you have 60 photons, uh, hitting your skin and there's no sunscreen, all 60 are gonna get in there, okay? If you have an SPF 15 sunscreen, you only have four going in there. So that is gives you a 93% protection, but only four uh, will go and reach the skin. An SPF 30, which gives you about a 97 protection, <laughs> gets you only two photons and SPF 60 is a double only one. So this is how basically it's easier to explain and understand. But 
the important thing is that even two, even one is more than zero. So cumulatively, if every second you have two photons coming to your skin, it will matter. The problem is also that people just don't use sunscreen in the quantity that we do the measurements, okay? The way they measure them and then um, basically label the sunscreens with the SPF factor. So no matter what for sailors, if you are, or anybody who is out on a direct sunshine, out and directly affected by the sun, should use the highest SPF you can. And in the United States is a 50, because after 50, it can be misleading, okay? But the new FDA regulation, they're trying to switch it to 60 because that doubles 15, 60 is double of 30, 30 is double and 15. So they think it's easier to understand. But don't believe in these hundreds and so because that doesn't make a big difference. Next is what is a broad spectrum. And that's actually me and Rio because my sister was uh, swimming there uh, in, as an, in the open water event. So I'm trying to find her cab there. It's not possible. So, so what is broad spectrum? Broad spectrum actually means that it covers both UVA and UVB range. So it has a both a broad coverage. Now, if you look at this, this is, a, this is basically highlighting of the coverage and the darker the color, the better the protection. Zinc oxide is here. So zinc oxide, and I will show you in another graph, is a very, that has the broadest coverage, but even broader is a shirt or a UPF clothing, okay? So nothing will beat a clothing. And I love sunscreen and I'm, I'm advocating sunscreen and sunscreen is the number one, um, Cream, lotion, potion, I'm, I'm recommending to my patients, but there will nothing will be a, a clothing. And guess what, actually? The best UV protection is actually jeans. <laughs> but we're not gonna say it in jeans. But basically it's easy to know how protective your clothing is. You just put it up in the sun uh, and then look, and the less comes through is the better your clothing. So it's very easy, but you, there are two types of filters, UV filters. There are the physical filters and the chemical filters, okay? And that's a very important concept to understand. And probably, you know, so I apologize if I'm, I'm, I'm making things or explaining things that you already know. But the physical sunscreens are actually little particles, mineral particles, okay? And they sit on the, sun, the surface on the skin and they reflect the rays. There is a caveat, and of course, I, I know a lot about filters. Um, the, the, if you start to micronize these, they become chemicals. If you start to nanosize these in order to lo uh, lose the white cast and that reflection, then they, <clears throat> they lose their efficacy, okay? So then nanosize the zinc actually is not as efficacious than micronized zinc. And I will not get into it, but I can answer the question about the problems with nanosized zinc. Chemical filters are chemical compounds that simply absorb the UV rays. They go through like a conformational change and that creates heat. And, and for the reason they also can be sometimes not stable. Some of them are very stable, but sometimes they're not stable. They also have to be absorbed into the top layer of the skin before you know before you go out there and get to the water because otherwise they get washed off and that's the reason for chemical sunscreens they say apply it 15 to 20 minutes before you go to the sun the physical sunscreens as long as you put it on and it sits there they will work the same thing is that as long as they still there at the end of the day because you see them on your face they will work, they will not get deactivated or destabilized. Now problem of course with the physical sunscreen that they can be somewhat cast you this white, white uh, cast because they reflect so you see the whiteness and that can be cosmetically not very elegant as opposed to the chemical ones, they're transparent so they can be cosmetically very elegant. Physical sunscreens are also non-soluble so they are much more difficult to formulate or put them in a cream or anything, okay? So, so that's why the lighter physical sunscreens sometimes have those little beads, those lotion watery type, because they just sink on the bottom of your, of your bottle. 
which means if you don't shake it, and they're like a shaka shaka type of sunscreen, if you don't shake it, it will sit on the bottom, you will not get the SPF you thought you were gonna get because it's all sitting on the bottom. So you have to shake them up. So those, that's the problem with them. And you have to make sure that when you buy those sunscreen, you shake them. And that's why when I created our formula, I didn't go with that because at first of all, I didn't want liquid dropping on the board, but I just wanted to make sure that it's in a cream format. So it sits there and it, you always get the SPF you want. So the problem with the chemical filters also that they're only covering certain spectrum of the UV light. They're not broad spectrum in the United States, okay? So you use them as a puzzle. You have to put many of these chemical sunscreen together in order you to get a broad spectrum. Not one single chemical filter in the United States will give you broad spectrum coverage both in the UVB and the UVA range. Problem is too that UVA has two, uh, UV2, which is a kind of closer to UVB and UVA1, which is far uh, UVA. And that is also very dangerous. And that's the range with, that is very difficult to cover. So the only sunscreen in the United States right now that has covers all is zinc oxide. Titanium dioxide is a very good physical sunscreen too, but it doesn't really cover too much of the far UVA range but it has a very strong UVB coverage. Very, very strong UVA co coverage is avobenzone here in the United States. Um, and then Maxwell SX um, that is coming from Europe has a really good UVA coverage, but of course has to be used with other sun chemical filters that have UVB coverage. Now, Europe is very different. Europe and other countries have so-called second generation filters and those second generation filters are fantastic and they're covering both old ranges. Um, I still think zinc or uh, titanium, uh, I'm sorry, zinc oxide is, um, is, is a shield, you know, so, but these second generation filters, I have to admit are very good and those are Tinosterm M actually Tinosorb S also, and Maxoril XL, if you are looking for European sunscreens. These are chemicals. Maxoril XL is a small molecule, so we will talk about absorption. It may be absorbed in the body, but Tinosorb M and Tinosorb S, although they're chemicals, they're very particulate, very large molecules, for, so they're not absorbed. I don't know what the FDA is gonna do, but I'm anticipating if we get in a new filter from Europe, it is going to be Tinosorb S. Just because it's, it's chemical and physical properties, it is impossible for that compound to be absorbed, which is now a very, very big concern for the S, uh, FDA. So, so you have to know your filters in your sunscreen. You cannot just pick up a, a sunscreen because it looks good or the SPF is 50. Of course, if the SPF is 50, probably has good filters, but again, the, I don't think the UVA coverage is very good by chemical filters in the United States. How do you know what filters do you have in your sunscreen? You look at the back of the bottle, okay? Because the front, this is, I don't wanna say which company, but basically this is a CVS. You can, it's a very nice sunscreen company, but the front looks almost the same. You have to like really look and read, but, in, in luckily in the United States, uh, there's a regulation. You have to separate the active ingredients, AKA UV filters for the, for the rest of the ingredients. So we are lucky because as in, in America, we, we can be more educated and look at what we are using. As opposed to in Europe, unfortunately, they don't have this rule. So all the ingredients are listed by their basically um, concentration. So these ingredients are all hidden in this big list of names, even I cannot pronounce, okay? And just because in Euro and in the US, it's FDA regulates as an over-the-counter drug, the sunscreen, and Europe, they are cosmetics. I actually wrote a, an article about all this regulatory stuff, what's going on with the FDA and sunscreen regulation for Scuttlebutt, if you wanna look for that. 
But basically the problem is also names. They're different. So octinoxate and oxybenzone, and we will talk about why I, I'm, these two chemical ingredients are in trouble right now, have a different INCI names um, international nomenclature for cosmetic ingredients in um, in Europe. So even if you know as an American octinoxate, you're going to have to find this very long name in your tube in Europe. So it's a problem. Luckily, even United States, the new FDA proposed regulation are asking to put the active ingredients in the front of the tube so that it will be even easier to read. So Main thing, check the back. Uh, it's a nice back, but so SPF is deceptive because growth spectrum, because you need to really, really also look at your ingredients, okay? So they're active UV filters. Um, water resistance. So just a couple of words, how they tested. They tested by putting people in a whirlpool actually for 20 minutes at a time and then just tap dry so they don't scrub. And then do it two, two times 20 minutes would be a four. And then you measure your MED or medium erythema dose, the SPF. And if it doesn't go lower, um, I think it's 75%, um, then, it's, then it's a 40, 40 minute. If it, if it lasts for four times these whirlpool uh, uh, kind of baiting, then it's an 80 minute water resistant. Australia has 120 minutes, so there's different regulations. Um, and, but this is the reason we have this like apply every two hour or apply even more often if you're in the water kind of guidance. I have to tell you that there are some, there are articles just uh, in the spring came uh, coming out and they measured uh, sunscreens and we're really trying to push in, um, for not having on the FDA kind of guidance and label that uh, apply every two minutes because uh, some sunscreens that are formulated really well are very water resistant. Um, I don't, I hear the time to plug for Harkin Derm, but Harkin Derm is one of them. You put it in the morning and uh, most of the complaints we get that, oh, I have to scrub it off at night and I can see still it's there. I'm like, well, dude, that's a good thing because there's a mineral filter. If it's still on your face at the end, at the day after you sailed all day long, it, you still have protection. And that's why it's a, it's a great product for children because as a mother, you only have to put on, on, the, on the kids once and you don't have to worry for reapplication. So I'm shifting gear now about all these kind of new, kind of fake news uh, and uh, scary thing. And we had this big publication and I don't even know how many people were sending me this. My friends like, have you seen this online um, a publication from Outdoor Magazine about is sunscreen the new margarine? So we, we thought margarine was good and it's terrible for you. So, so sunscreen safety, this became a really, really big issue. Um, and was permeating the media last year and, uh, in, and 2018. So it's a really hot topic. And the way it started that 2018 uh, May, actually just shortly when we launched Hark and Durham, Hawaii banned two ingredients in sunscreen, oxybenzone and octane oxide. Shortly Key West banned it, but then it's apparently reversed. I know exactly who were the parties that were involved. Palau, other islands, there's a lot of uh, US Virgin Islands. You have to find, uh, pay a fee if they find these ingredients in your sunscreen. So this is all about reef safety. Now I have to tell you, I'm not a marine biologist. So this is where I spend a lot of times and you can ask me any questions about UV light and human skin, UV light and reefs, that gets a little trickier. But I tell you that these are the two ingredients that are generally are talking about and they're banned and generally are more most well researched. And then when they when there there's a ton of in vitro and also kind of ex vivo experiments, which means like in tanks where they increase the concentration of these ingredients and look at the coral, what happens. And there's absolutely no doubt, and I'll tell you what happens that it happens. But there are St. John, uh, Trung Bay, and also Hawaii, they measured concentration in bays, especially bays that more like a horseshoe, horseshoe 
shaped and more protected bays, and, and they have found high enough concentration that in the tank actually um, harmed and killed the coral. So the issue is with oxybenzone also is that this is the number one, this is the oldest ingredient that has been not only just in sunscreen, but all kinds of other products that have, have some sun protective um, kind of claims. So makeups and other moisturizer that say SPF 15, okay? So it's an interesting point though, that in the United States, if your product doesn't say sunscreen, it is not regulated by the FDA. So just because your moisturizer will say SPF 15, I'm not always sure it's a real SPF 15 or they ever measure that. They just drop the oxybenzone in there in order to give you an SPF. Also, obviously, yeah, I don't have to explain to you that if you're putting an SPF 50 moisturizer and on the top, you're putting an SPF 15 sunscreen, you're not gonna end up with SPF 30. But anyhow, so it's still SPF 15. So problem with oxybenzone is also, it's both bioaccumulated and biomagnified. So the, the fish eats the little fish and the big fish eats the fish, so, and it gets accumulated in the body. So we have many, 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 many experimental evidence that it does really hurt the coral, okay? So it also accumulates in the muscle and, and muscles. It hurts the zeo, zeocentili, so the algae in the coral, okay? Uh, also, in, interesting, it can decrease fertility and reproduction and cause female characteristic in male fish. So, so it, it, it's, there's plenty of evidence that it, it has a sort of an endocrine or an estrogenic effect. I think the easiest to explain is like, okay, it's like giving, a, giving birth control pill for your fish, okay? So, but of course, there's a lot of people are fighting this and they all say coral bleaching, which is basically when the algae leaves the coral is coming from, coming from a lot of other environmental effects, increase of temperature, uh, water temperature, of overexposure of sunlight and uh, exter extreme low tides. So this is, this, is, this is just a drop of the water. Uh, we know that apparently 14,000 ton of sunscreen washes off around coral reefs. So I, my, when my, and my uh, uh, patients ask me about this, I say the same thing as just like CO2 emission like every drop matters. So if you have a sunscreen that you can use that you know it doesn't hurt the coral, why would you use something which has the potential to be harmful? And side note, oxybenzone also is converted to an even more dangerous chemical in chlorine pools. So nobody talks about that, but there is some evidence for that. Human safety, um, FDA has really been on this. And of course, these sunscreen ingredients were all basically uh, grandfathered in, never studied, okay? They would never study the current sunscreens, really what they do. But we know there's evidence, as I told you, especially oxybenzone, that they have some estrogenic effects. So the FDA studied them finally and said that, and avobenzone, oxybenzone, and octicrylene, and acamsu, which is maxoral, um, and they, they found that they got into the bloodstream very quickly. Now they used it a lot on the whole body and re reapplied it every two hours, but they basically used it as if, as if the people would follow instructions, they never do. But what we found that these sunscreens are all very rapidly absorbing the blood and oxybenzone is the one which is crazy. It goes very high. So, so okay, we eat, things the week they, it, it comes to our blood and, and toxicity is, is, is basically dose dependent. So, and we've been using these sunscreens forever. Nobody ever turned into a, a, a female. So what's going on? So there is of course industry who's loaded with these, uh, these chemical filters more because they're much cheaper to buy, much cheaper to formulate, much cheaper to uh, sell. They are up in arms against it because they all say we've been using these sunscreen filters forever, and nothing happened just because it goes to the blood. What does that mean? So we have to actually do more research. But again, zinc oxide doesn't go in the blood; it sits on the surface. So if you have a filter that you can use and doesn't go in your blood, why would you use it? The other issue is that I gotta tell you that the um, 
we've been always telling mothers not to use these chemical filters on children. So why do we recommend not to use this in children and then we don't say we shouldn't use it in adults? So these are just uh, basically FDA now came up last uh, year, February with these so-called um, proposed regulatory guidelines. And it's a long story, it's very interesting, but something called GRACE, which is generally recognized as safe and effective. And basically FDA proposed that only zinc and titanium dioxide are GRACE right now. There are some filters we don't even use, they're not safe, but all the rest, all the chemical uh, filters have insufficient data for use in sunscreen. So, and the battle goes on. This is, this is another talk. I can tell you what's happening, but uh, this is right now for it with the FDA. So one more sentence about sprays. As a dermatologist, I hate sun, I hate sprays. All those sprays are the most sold and most loved sunscreen. But aerosol, the problem is that it's aerosols are bad for you. you and it's much easier to aerosolize a, a chemical filter. So usually sprays are always chemical filters. If they are mineral filters, you do not wanna inhale titanium dioxide or zinc in your lung, okay? So it's also not a good thing. So basically in summary, zinc, oxide and titanium dioxide are also the reef friendly and child friendly sunscreen. So you look at your tubes, and you, you, in the front, you look at your SPF. It, in my opinion, if you're a sailor, you need to use an SPF 50. Um, you have to use broad spectrum and it has to be a, at least 80 minute water resistant because it means it's stable, it's sweat and other water will not bring it off. Turn it around and look at the filters. It has to be zinc and titanium dioxide. And then you can look at the other ingredients but that gets a little tricky, but you should use, look for some antioxidants that actually add uh, some um, added um, basically benefits. So again, you know, this is sort of what we think of uh, how the sunscreen in, in rank most safe to least safe. So this is a, a, an article I wrote for Seahorse Magazine, a little bit in details if you wanna read about it. So again, the human safety studies are ongoing. Certain chemical filters are harmful to coral and maybe to humans and zinc oxide and titanium dioxide are great. So this is where I'd like to stop or I basically just wanted to talk about a few because mm. I see we are kind of running out of the time, just a few things about Hark and Derm. And again, as I told you, I created this because I felt like I could give a good guidelines, guidance and a good choice for sailors. This, there, are, there are lots of sunscreens. Most of them are not very good. There are some that are good, but might as well point out what you need to use. And of course, it's with Peter. We, uh, as a Harkin, you know, and I'm a dermatologist, the Harkin Derm was coined and, um, and, Harkin Derm is SPF 50, it's all mineral, it has antioxidant, it's extremely water resistant, it really lasts all day long. I'm not allowed to say that on paper, but it does. It's non-greasy and these are all things I asked sailors when I was formulating the sunscreen. It's really hydrating. So, and it doesn't drip, so it's not a liquidy mm -hmm. format. It dries extremely uh, quickly. And of course, it's child safe and reef safe. And then Jimmy was the reason, and I just wrote an article about how this whole started with, um, with the after sun. And, uh, and he was the reason because he asked me, hey, I know I have to use sunscreen. I mean, I grew up in Australia and I have red hair. I mean, but I don't know what to put on my skin when I get off the, uh, out of the sun and off off the boat and I just feel my skin is suffering. And I was like, wow, he's a guy and he's asking me about skincare. And I said, oh, I think it's important that you people, I'm so, I was so happy because I always thought that a second step is much more important. And you know, he's a redhead and it's a very important thing in redhead. Unfortunately, this damage doesn't stop. There is lots of science showing that there's more more oxidative stress even when you get out of the sun is happening in your skin so i created this after sun which is kind of like now we think like we should have just named it 
daily skin repair lotion because a lot of think it, people think it's like a glorified aloe vera, which is so not true because the after sun is so important. It is like, I call it the, the two-step solution. Even if you don't use Harkan, you need to use daily protection or morning protection, evening repair. Your skin has a circadian rhythm. So in the morning, you need to protect, protect, protect. And in the evening, you have to repair the barrier, put antioxidants in so that everything can get repaired so you're ready next morning to go out again. All right. So I think um, this would be it. So I hope you, I, I taught you a little bit of how to, the sun affect the skin, that ingredients really matter. Turn around the bowl, look at the back. Uh, talked a bit about coral safety, human safety, and um, gave you some recommendations. Thank you guys. And uh, listen, um, if you have any questions, uh, I hope we, we have some time for it. I'm sorry that I ran, I talked too much. <laughs> but you can always write me an email and I'm more than happy to answer any of your questions. Thanks, Josh, it's yours. Thanks, Edith. Thanks so much. We do actually have some questions for you. Awesome. So if you don't mind, um, and I think we're fine going over a little bit just to answer some of these questions. Uh, someone came in hot and heavy, so it was great. But um, thank you so much for doing this presentation. It was great. And uh, I'm sure being a redhead in the sunny Australia outback must be tough. So reading that article might be a really good read for some people about Jimmy. A um, couple of questions that came in. One was, uh, does the UV lightweight clothing on the market today protect against skin cancer and damage? That's a great question. So if the UV light, we call it UPF, UV protection factor. So the SPF for creams is UPF. And um, they measured that actually. Uh, again, um, you can either have a UPF clothing just because it's densely woven, okay? Um, or you can add certain chemicals that gives you get, may, basically filters in your material, clothing material, which will filter out the light. Uh, unfortunately, that can be washed out. And also when you wash your material, no matter what a lot, it gets a little bit thinner. Bottom line is absolutely. I mean, uh, there's nothing better than you wearing uh, clothing protection or hat long sleeve short, a shirt, long sleeve pants, uh, gloves, if you can, nothing beats that. Great, um, another question, uh, can more often application of lower SPF equal the same effectiveness as higher SPF sunscreen? And oh, big no, big no, big no. You, you can do that. As I told you, you cannot layer things and two SPF 15 layered on top of each other will not give you a 30. However, it is a very important point and we've, it's been studied that an application of the, one application of the sunscreen sometimes misses areas. That's why actually uh, mothers like Hark and Derm or like zinc containing sunscreen because you can see what you missed. So I really tell them, hey, this is a good thing because at the beginning you can see it, then you start to rub it in and it gets less white. So it's been studied that if you apply the same sunscreen twice right, right after each other, it will help you. It will dramatically decrease areas that you missed, okay? You will not increase um, the SPF, although probably you will increase a little bit just because you have a thicker layer and you're applying more to what you should. But most importantly, applying it twice right away um, will help you to, to cover areas that you may have missed the beginning. That's a great point. Um, there's another question. It says, um, if there's any, uh, is there anything that I can do to reverse damage that was done years ago if I wasn't as diligent with applying sunscreen as I am now? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So again, as I told you, you can dramatically decrease your skin cancer risk by using sunscreen, but there you can use a lot of um, topical active ingredients that will actually uh, lighten those pigment spots like sunspots that will induce collagen production. And then when you get, want to go from, from creams to more procedures that there are laser procedures and other uh, light-based procedures that can, or energy-based procedures that can refresh your skin. There is also 
the medications we use like 5-fluorouracil or photodynamic therapy that specifically kills the precancerous cells called actinic keratosis and superficial skin cancer. So there's a ton of things you, you can do. So see your dermatologist. Definitely. Um, another question came in, says, um, when does sunscreen expire? Is it one year or more? Awesome question and I missed that, okay? So um, usually, unless it's written, it expires in three years, but almost all sunscreen expire in two years. There is a caveat, huh? However, sunscreen gets, if you, if the, 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 the cream can go up to 50 Celsius degrees in the trunk of your car in a hot sunny day, okay? Or even the temperature. So once the sunscreen is in a hot temperature, uh, that it ac actually can expire much quicker and break down. Okay, great, good to know. Um, and, and one of our viewers missed what you said earlier about how often um, Harkenderm lasts and how often you need to reapply uh, the Harkenderm brand. Okay, so I can tell this, but I cannot write it down because FDA looks at these kind of claims. We call them cosmetic claims and the FDA really wants us to say apply a sunscreen every two hours. But I tell you that what I heard and what I experienced is that it basically if you apply it well and you don't need too much you you need to just apply that it does not white but it absorbs it will last all day long and um last question here and then i actually have one as well too okay um if i'm wearing sunscreen can my skin tilt still produce vitamin d oh Awesome question. And vitamin D is a separate talk. So vitamin D is very important for our bones, okay? And it helps our immune system as well. There is a, a little bit of problem with vitamin B that the, the, the only wavelength that actually produce um, from uh, vitamin D precursors in your skin are the burning UVB rays, okay? So, so if you are absolutely covering your skin, you cannot produce vitamin D, all right? So then you have to uh, complement your vitamin D by taking vitamin D supplements. However, very, very short time of exposure is enough to give you enough vitamin D. So in midday, in a summer, basically if your skin is white, it's about 10 minutes is enough, okay? The darker your skin, the longer, time you need for vitamin D production because that melanin is actually protecting you from the UVB. So what I'd like to say is that we jokingly say that figure out a spot like your buttocks that never seen a sun. So it's white. No, I'm just joking now. Okay. It's white. It's never going to have skin cancer and put it out for 10 minutes midday and you're going to have so much vitamin D. <laughs> so, uh, um, you you will get some light, no sunscreen, hundred percent, not even Harkin Derm. So you will get some sun through. Which if you are a sailor, you will get plenty of vitamin D. But you have to think about supplementing if you're really really staying out of the sun. So to that effect too, um, some people who have uh, some um, uh, skin conditions such as rosacea or psoriasis are told by their dermatologist to get plenty of sun on it, even go to tanning beds um, and potentially don't use sunscreen for a little bit. What, what's your recommendation for that in terms of the vitamin D that they get from the sun to help with their condition? Oh gosh, Josh, you're, you're asking me my favorite questions. First of all, rosacea actually gets worse in the sun. So pr I'm sure it's not the dermatologist who told you that because rosacea uh, is uh, heat also activated, you know, so, and as I told you, the infrared is, heat is dilating your vessels and making your rosacea worse. But there are certainly some conditions where they get better on the sun and why? Because those conditions are immune stimulated, immune mediated. And what you do is by putting, uh, by putting sun on your skin, you suppress your immune system. So your dead disease will get better because that's why you take steroid pills to decrease inflammation, okay? so. Uh, or so like psoriasis and, and um, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, even bad eczema gets better. Now we have some special, very narrow band UV light, the 311, that specifically does that. They will, they will drive out those cells that trigger the disease, but they will not give you skin cancer. 
do I, we don't, yes, in all times we went um, and went out in the sun and then skin disease get better, but that's not the way we want people to do it and anymore, you know? You need to specifically get that specific light by your doctor that will help that disease. Great, and good, UV great and, sure, and the one more thing, mm -hmm. tanning booths are UVA lights, okay? UVA lights, so they're aging, but they also can you, give you skin cancer. They will not give you vitamin D because it's not the type of light which gives you vitamin D, number one. Second, it has 10 times more UVA light than normal sun, so it will age you like crazy. And it is also not the wavelength that will really immunosuppress you because, or help the disease. So do not go to a tanning booth, please. Great advice. Um, and then one of the questions that came up is just about the presentation from Susie Leach, of all people. Uh, oh, okay. that, uh, Hi, Susie. Uh, may, uh, may we get a copy of the presentation suggestions? Do you have this presentation available or could you Absolutely. email it to people if they ask for it? Yes, I'm, I'm very happy to share anything. And um, if people want to get in touch with you, do you have a public email address that they can email the questions they can or whatnot? The, uh, and, uh, edit, edit at harkenderm.com. Great. Well, um, thank you so much, Edith. We very, very thank much you. appreciate you being here with us. And I'm sure we all learned a lot. And again, um, any of you watching can feel free to email Edith at edith at harkenderm.com, that's E-D-I-T, at H-A-R-K-E-N-D-E-R-M.com. Uh, ask her any of these questions that you might have missed, or she can pass you along the presentation. Susie, if you want to email her, I'm sure she'll pass along the presentation we'll as well. Text it. We'll text it already today, once <laughs> before, so. <laughs> there you go. It's probably in your inbox already there, Susie. Uh, but thank She's you again, real Edith. Expert. Thank you again, Edith, for joining us. And thank you to all our viewers for joining us and tuning in. And for everyone who's going to be watching this on playback later, I'm sure many people are. And again, if you want to see any more of the great things that Edith and the folks at Harkin Durham are doing, head over to harkindurham.com to learn more. And as always, if you enjoyed today's session or any of the other sessions that we've put on or continue to put on, please, please support our, support our efforts to build a community of engaged and active sailors. Uh, through the starboard portal by purchasing or renewing your U.S. sailing membership. We have tons and tons and tons of great content coming up every single day this week and every day until at least the end of May, if not more. We're continuing to build content into our calendars and booking people out. Um, we have tons of this content coming to you, and thank you to all of U.S. sailing members. Uh, because of them, we're able to adapt and evolve to better serve sailors with content like this. So please join us today and visit mem.ussailing.org to join or renew your U.S. sailing membership and uh, join us in making this world a little bit better place for every sailor. Thank you again, Edith. Very much appreciate it. Thank you, it. Thank Thank you all for joining everybody. us. We'll see you on the water soon, Edith. Yeah, I hope to see everybody soon in person. <laughs> Thanks again. Take care. Bye.